Sanjay. Thank you so much for inviting us here. Welcome to Pizza Hut and Safai Pizza Hut, uh, Anisha. Lovely to have you here. Lovely to be here. It's been a while that I've been at the Pizza Hut because I usually just order in. So it'll be great to just have a conversation here. Okay, so show me your secret sauce inside. Come on, let's go in. Take a measuring cup. Let's put in some onions. And much of this is all... Uh, you know how you spread it so that you ensure that there is a certain evenness. I put what is called a quality ring which just sits over the pan and okay. this gives the contours of the sauce. From flour to dough to pizza base to everything here, everything is made at the store every day. We don't wow. operate a commissary uh, at all. While our pizza gets cooked, let me ask you, everything I see around me, I'm sure, is up at least 10 to 20% on a year-on-year -year basis, right, with the inflation and everything. How are you managing that? Are you looking at shrinkflation? Are you looking at increasing the prices? So, you're right. Inflation that we've seen this year on all commodities has been the highest that perhaps I've seen over 20 years. So, typically, you've got to cover it through prices, price increases. But what we do is that can we take a price increase to the extent of two-thirds or perhaps three-fourths of the food inflation? So, I mean, you know, prior to this year, we were experiencing food inflation of about, say, six to seven percent. Right. We used to take a price increase about three to four percent. So what that does, Anisha, is that over a period of time, actually product gets far more affordable, um, you know, from the wallet point of view. Right. So this year also we've had to take some amount of uh, pricing. We've taken about 7-8% on Pizza Hut, whereas our inflation is nearly double digit. Right. So we've lost a little bit on uh, gross margins, but we've tried to ensure that transactions remain strong. If transactions remain strong, we are able to uh, derive leverage benefits mm. and therefore ensure that our restaurant margins are still uh, maintained. So yes, because we have seen that the restaurant margins have seen a massive jump over the last three to four years, right? There has been an improvement of what, around 700 basis point is what I hear. Um, with the gross margins being under pressure, do you expect that trajectory of improvement to continue? What's the number that you think could be sustainable? So in quarter two, we delivered a restaurant margin of 15%. Right. And I include all lease rentals in this 15%. The journey from 7-8% when we started off many years or even three years ago to 15 is a different journey and I'll talk about that. But uh, today as we look at 15%, we've got two types of restaurants. So our older restaurants which are slightly more larger, uh, larger and therefore more inefficient, those deliver say double digit EBITDA but these new restaurants actually de deliver higher than that 15%. So I expect this to perhaps remain slightly increased over a period of time. I think, like I said, while we have taken gross, while our gross margins have gone down, leverage benefits have enabled us to hold those restaurant margins. And I hope that should continue in the future too. Okay, in the meantime, our pizza will be ready. Let's carry forward the conversation. Sanjay, it's been quite a transformation for Pizza Hut, right? From where it was five years ago as a casual dine-in to the entire journey towards being omni-channel. What's been the strategy around that and where are we in that journey now? So when Safari came into existence six years ago, we were very excited with the Pizza Hut possibility. So it was, like you said, a casual dine-in brand. The uh, incredible part about the brand is when you talk to consumers, share of mind is very high but share of wallet is very low. And I think we had to fix that. And as a number two brand to a very powerful number one brand, if you're not differentiated and if you don't offer something that is, um, uh, that is hutke to the consumer, you won't do well. So we went about identifying where do we win and what do we need to improve. And there were really five areas. So we said product and product innovation is where we win. How do we double down on that? When you close your eyes and think of Pizza Hut is all about the dine-in experience. And therefore, we've got to hold that dine-in experience in a very valuable manner. 
So what do we need to improve? One is our store economics were not great and therefore our accessibility was poor. And that's because we had these either these very large casual dine-in restaurants or hole-in-the-wall delivery restaurants and both of them didn't work. Mm. And really the answer was an omni-channel restaurant where dine-in, delivery and takeaway, all three were important and you've gotten this dine-in experience. So what you're seeing here, a 1200 square foot restaurant, ideally 45 covers, dine-in does well, delivery also does well. So we sorted the accessibility part. Then we realized that setting up the delivery infrastructure will always be an uphill task. Mm. And that's why five, six years ago, we uh, engaged with Swiggy and Zomato. And they helped us level the playing field in terms of delivery. So delivery as contribution, even prior to COVID, was about 25, 26%. Today, it's nearly 50%. So delivery, we have seen a, a big bump up. And the final piece of this puzzle was changing value. Okay. So when you, so today we think of Pizza Hut as a QSR brand. And as a QSR brand, you have to play with the value codes of QSR, which means that a meal under 200, 250 is what you've got to offer the consumer. And QSR is all about meal bundles. Right. So we've changed our pricing strategy over the last two or three years. And that's the time, um, if you look and compare our meal bundles with the, uh, our competitor brand, you'll find that actually from a value perspective, we are, we are outstanding or even better uh, you know, compared to the number one brand. And then in July, August, we thought that there is a hole in our range, which is a pizza under 100 rupees. And that's when we launched the Flavor Fun Pizza. And quite interestingly, we did it also in a very unique Pizza Hut manner. So pizza, so anything that you expect from Pizza Hut, it has to taste fantastic. So here is a pizza, five different sauces, a minimum of two toppings. It's just an outstanding product. And perhaps you've got something here for you. Uh, the pizzas that you made downstairs, uh, Anisha. <laughs> Well, I don't know about yours, but mine would be, uh, we'll have to see how it really tastes. So, yes, we'll done it. Whichever is the better one is yours. <laughs> but can I, do, but can do I you cook you? a lot? Is that something that is your passion as well? Uh, so, uh, I think if you run a food company, if you don't know food yourself, that's a big disadvantage. And I'm passionate about food. I love food. I love to cook. Um, I think at home, uh, I cook far more often, or my wife just doesn't cook at all. And <laughs> she's listening in. Yeah, Choose she's your listening words in, right. Yeah, yeah. But and she'll admit it. Uh, so, yeah, cooking is is a bit of a passion area with me. But let's let's see how this has gone. Yes, please, but, absolutely. Can I but, serve you? Please. But how many times, let's say, in a week, do you order in? Honestly, tell me. So I would I would eat out a little more than I would order in. So I would eat out perhaps two, three times a week and order in perhaps once a week. And uh, uh, yeah, here is the, and let me, let's try the other pizza. And I'm going to take a piece myself. Wow. Looks quite interesting. Yeah, so as yeah. you said, the better one would be mine. The better one I'm is I'm diving right in. I yeah, can't you wait. You dive in <laughs> right in. I'm going to take a piece also and... Mmm. Mmm. That's yummy. You did a great job, Anisha. <laughs> Thank you so much. Let's talk about the expansion plans as well because you are largely, uh, you know, concentrated in metros and larger cities. Going forward, what's the plan in terms of store addition? Are you also looking at getting in deeper into the tier two, tier three cities? So there are two uh, parts to our expansion. One is, uh, I say that we had to have the license to grow, which means that is our new store economic model good enough to get us paybacks of three years at a store level? So if I look at five, six years ago, a Pizza Hut store would pay back in seven, eight years, yeah. which is really no payback. So we worked hard on this model 
And as we have cracked the model and today paybacks are in the region of three years, we have started to expand significantly faster than we have done in the past. You know, where are the gaps that we see? So while new towns will certainly be a part of our expansion strategy, really the big joy would come in increasing density in the largest uh, markets. So if you look at, uh, if you look at Mumbai, hmm. the principal competitor would have perhaps three or four times the number of stores that we have. So in many areas, accessibility of the brand itself is an issue. So while we will do new stores, the larger expansion will come from the bigger towns. So Sanjay, since we are talking about expansion, is it going to be largely organic or are you looking at it the inorganic route as well? So when we started off, we started off with this aspiration that can we be India's best restaurant operator. And that's the platform that we are trying to create. We are trying to create a, a full restaurant platform, which means that there should be growth opportunities available beyond KFC and Pizza Hut. We think KFC and Pizza Hut will itself give us multi-decade growth. But everything that we are setting up, especially our back-end processes, systems, is to be able to perhaps acquire a third brand and bolt it on. Hmm. So most certainly, we are always looking at uh, brands that we could uh, acquire. I think we've articulated also clearly that what drives success in this restaurant space, and there are seven mantras that we have, that we want success at scale. So we want a brand that can, uh, that can have the density of a, a Pizza Hut or a KFC in terms of number of stores. So is this something that we're likely to hear soon? Anything in the pipeline? So like I said, we are always looking at brand opportunities, but it's too premature perhaps for me to talk about it today. But will there be a third brand in the medium term future with all these conditions uh, to be fulfilled? I would say yes. Okay, so let's talk about your other power brand now, KFC. That's been doing spectacularly well and what a power brand it has been, right? What's the vision for that? What's the expansion plan? You look at KFC and I mean, it's just a powerhouse brand. And the trajectory of the brand over the last five years has been just stunning. Yes. I think we have gone back to the roots. We are unapologetically chicken. <laughs> and um, so once the core consumer loves the brand, then from there we are, expand, we are able to expand the uh, reach, you know, the outer reaches of the brand and bring in new consumers. There are, there's a big macro trend at play which is that as disposable income increases, as per capita GDP increases, you find that animal protein consumption increases. So there was a recent national food health survey done by the government. That survey shows that chicken consumption or animal protein consumption has increased 8x over the last 20 years. So from 400 grams to some 3, 3.2 kgs. And expected to triple or quadruple in the next 7, 8 years. Now, this is one big macro trend. And the mm. second trend is that among animal protein in Asia especially and in India, chicken is perhaps 90% of the animal, um, protein. of the animal protein that is consumed. So, today when you think of chicken, you think of KFC. KFC. Yeah. And so, that's what makes the brand. And the, again, like I said, production processes are very different. So from raw chicken to marination to breading to frying, everything is done at the store. And that's why the product, the food is so tasty, it's so fresh and it's just fantastic. Well, yes, Sancho, but the other thing in terms of the business is that people regularly compare you with the other franchisee holder as well, Deviani International. And there have been multiple talks of whether at some point of time there could be a merger or there is a concern about the overlap of certain territories. How would you answer that? So, uh, six years ago, there was an opportunity for YUM, perhaps, to, um, to consolidate everything under one franchisee. For whatever reason they chose, they chose to bring Safai Foods in. And when we came in, we were excited with this QSR opportunity. And I think it's a multi-decade opportunity. So, um, from our perspective, we want to build this food uh, space 
we want to build KFC and Pizza Hut in India. And like I said, perhaps a third brand in the future. So from all that I can do is focus on what I see here and now, which is the opportunity that is in front of us. How do we make the best of it? But is there any concern in terms of overlapping of territories or any um, possibility of a merger of sorts at some point of time? So uh, I would say categorically no. Okay. Uh, there is some. There's no overlap in territories in uh, KFC, but there's a some overlap in Pizza Hut. But the formats that we operate are also different, and therefore there's no overlap in the format. So we've talked about KFC, we've talked about Pizza Hut, but one concern that the street had this year was the entire economic turmoil that we have seen in Sri Lanka, right? And operations, I'm sure, were affected for you as well. How are things on the ground now? So I would say as a country, things are still critical but stable. Okay. So operating conditions have improved. Now uh, the blackout hours are much lesser. We are able to get fuel. We are able to get LPG. Uh, we are able to import stuff. So from an operating perspective, things are, I would say, 90% normal. Okay. However, inflation is a big concern there and inflation has been 80, 90 percent. We've had to take price increases in the region of 40, 50 percent. There's been a gross margin uh, erosion and therefore it's tough on the consumer's wallet. Now, having said that, Pizza Hut, especially in Sri Lanka, is a powerhouse brand. In fact, Sri Lanka is the only country in the world where Pizza Hut is the number one QSR brand. Wow. And I think the way that we run it in Sri Lanka is outstanding. So we've got certain advantages. We run the omni-channel format in, in uh, Sri Lanka, uh, dine-in, delivery and takeaway. In fact, the India experience is a little bit of, uh, you know, a takeaway from what we do in Sri Lanka. We've just got other competitive advantage. We do our own delivery there. The brand is very strong. Innovation pipeline is very strong. So during this period, we've continued to gain market share in Sri Lanka. And I think from every perspective, we feel that we've got to double down on the country right now. Oh. And as, as it starts to improve and consumer wallet starts to, the pain on the consumer wallet starts to ease, we will uh, be able to reap the benefits of what we are doing today. From a, um, you know, from just doubling down on the brand. So we continue to expand. So this year itself, we'll open nearly 20, 21 stores in Sri Lanka. So I think the opportunity exists. This will take perhaps two, three years to tide over. But I, but the brand itself is very strong. Okay, so 20 to 30 stores in Sri Lanka. But what about back home? What's the store addition plan in terms of numbers? Where do you see yourself? Let's say three to five years from here on. So in February of this year, when we announced our quarter three results, we had ended up December with about 550 restaurants. And what we guided the market was, we expect us to be able to double this count over the next three to four years time, mm -hmm. which means um, roughly 130 to 160 stores. We opened 142 stores last year and we are on track uh, this year also to be able to hit these numbers. But do you track the stock prices very closely? Is that something which is an everyday thing for you? I must confess that I don't look at the stock price. I perhaps look at it on a Saturday. How has it ended? And we've got our investor relations team that sends out a mail on Monday, um, uh, you know, with the ending stock price. I think from the team's perspective, we can do the best that we can do to influence the stock price is run our business really well. And therefore, my focus, the team's focus is just do the right things with the business. Everything else will follow, including the stock price. So I think that's where my focus is. It's good to hear that is where your focus is because you are in a situation which I don't envy at all because you have to talk to your fee investors, you have to talk to your investors. Plus there is uh, uh, Yum Brands, the uh, owner of the franchisee that you have to deal with, plus another franchisee manager as well in terms of Devyani International. 
Uh, how difficult is the decision making regarding menu setting, prices, etc.? Because I understand you can't do it on your own, right? The price setting, etc. We operate in what we call a cooperative or a co-op. So it is Sapphire, Yam, Devyani, all of us come together to take the big decisions on the brand. And I mean, it might seem difficult, but I've seen it over the last six, seven years, and it's quite easy. Actually, you're now harnessing the ideas that three different entities would have. Our objectives are common. Our objectives are the same. And therefore, any product idea or pricing idea that comes from anywhere, it's put on the table and all three of us work together. And therefore, you know, it sees light of day. I mean, it also reflects in how we uh, source ingredients. So we are able to use common um, uh, strength to be able to get the best you know, possible pricing and so on. So I think it's a collaborative partnership rather than each one of us trying to do uh, things on our own. So Sanjay, one overhang on the stock has been the possibility of supply into the stock markets with the private equity players perhaps looking at an exit. How would you want to answer that? Yeah. So private equity is much misunderstood in India. Everyone thinks private equity has only a medium term life. In our case, actually, our promoter, Samara Capital, has had a multi-decade view on the category and on Safari Foods. And they are part of the promoter group. They came in seven years ago, and they continue. And part of their shareholding is locked up in perpetuity. Having said that, um, when we started, there were four private equity players that you know, set up uh, Safari Foods. Hmm. One of them exited. Um, a year, year and a half ago, we ha we got another player, Edelweiss, who came in in a pre-IPO through their pre-IPO fund. They exited about four months ago, and it's likely now that there are perhaps two of our original private equity um, investors who might be looking at some level of encashment of their initial um, investment. Mm -hmm. Having said that, it's important that the principal promoter group is quite strong and quite stable. So is that the block that Street is worried about? The two PE investors who are looking at an exit, yeah. what could be the size yeah. of it? So I wouldn't say anyone's worried about it because there's sufficient demand, that I think, that has been created and there are a lot of people evincing interest in Safari Foods. In fact, if you see, over the last one year, there was some article that said, the number of domestic institutional investors in Safari Foods, the percentage of right. domestic, is among the top 10 of all IPOs that have you know, been done over the last uh, 12 to 15 months. So having said that, like I said, there are perhaps one or two of our earliest stage investors who might be looking at uh, you know, encashing some portion of their uh, stake. So who will come on board then? Are you looking at another private equity player to take a, you know, more role in the business or is it going to be offloaded in the open market? So really it's, it's nothing that I am influencing. Like I said, me and my team are focused on the business. There are enough and more uh, people who would be interested in uh, you know, getting into Sapphire and actually um, being with us over this multi-decade opportunity. So it's really left up to those, the sellers to find the buyers. But I think there's enough and more demand for the stock. Let me put you on a spot. Please sing a song for us. Any Hindi song that you like, your favorite. Are you serious, Anisha? Yes, please. Are you serious? Please do that. It'll be quite fun. <clears throat> yeah, let me do a song that I, I like to sing. Bade Ache लगते हैं बड़े अच्छे लगते हैं ये धरती ये नदियाँ ये रहना और अनीशा Wow, you've got me blushing on that. Thank you so much for that. On that note, we'll wrap up the conversation. Sanjay, you've been an excellent sport. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Anisha, and thank you, ET Now. <laughs>